Good evening. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Allison Patillo, and I am with the Aspen Times, and I, along with Peter Bauman of the Post Independent, are thrilled you all are here. So thank you. I'm as eager as all of you to learn more about maintaining mobility, balance, and athleticism throughout life. I don't know if you noticed, I did come out here with a cane. It's temporary, but I'm all the more eager. Um, on that note, I did have several mobility tests planned for us, but since I can't participate, I don't think that would be fair. Plus, we don't have a whole lot of extra room tonight, which is a great thing, so we'll skip the mobility tests. Instead, and since it is Active Aging Week, I'm going to give you a couple of bits of inspiration. So just yesterday, 104-year-old Dorothy Hoffner may have set the new record as the oldest skydiver in her tandem jump yesterday. So there's that, right? Then for another one, Dot Sowery, I think it might be the name Dot and Dorothy, I think these are some, some tough women, is 90, and she just set the new American women's record in the half marathon uh, in Chicago in September in the 90 to 94 age group <laughs> in three hours, 33 minutes, and 47 seconds. So that is something for all of us to aspire to. So looking for a lot of good insight from you guys tonight. Um, then before introducing our panel, I want to thank the sponsors and partners who helped bring this event to the community. Those include Compass Peak Imaging in Glenwood Springs. I am a customer. They're great. Uh, to call for this wonderful venue and renew senior communities. Then for our panel, these people have done lots of amazing things and have incredible work going on. So I'm gonna give a brief in intro and then they can tell you all the exciting things. So first we have Jennifer Lapsley Stevens, nope, Jennifer Stevens Lapsley, who is among other things, professor and director of the Rehab Science PhD program at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Then we have Bill Fabricini, who is a Valley resident and a clinical or specialist in orthopedic sports therapy and a sports performance coach. And then on the end, we have Dusty Anderson, who is a doctor at the, <laughs> woohoo! <laughs> Awesome, so you better ask nice questions, softball questions for him. Um, he is a doctor at the Stedman Clinic where he specializes in non-surgical modalities to get patients back to peak performance. And then as our moderator, we have Lee Tetchfarber, who is founder of Renew Senior Living Communities and, on the advisor, and is an advisory board member of both the Noble Institute of Healthy Aging at DU and the Neuroscience Innovation Initiative at CU. So with that, Lee, I turn it over to you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, so really impressive crowd here. Really, really impressive. So thanks for coming out. Um, I want to start with an audience poll just to get a sense of who we have in the audience. Um, so I've got a few questions. So raise your hand if you're under the age of 50. OK. <laughs> all right. Small, small percentage of the audience. OK, now raise your hand if you're 51 to 70. OK, and then if you are 70 plus. Got it. OK, very interesting. So uh, next question is um, raise your hand if you exercise like zero to one times per week. <laughs> <laughs> Now raise your hand if you exercise two to four times per week. Okay. And then lastly, raise your hand if you work out, if you exercise five to seven times per week. Okay, wow, very, very fit audience. Yes, applause to that. Uh, okay, and then uh, lastly, um, raise your hand if you think that you can't gain muscle strength after you enter, say, the last third of your life. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so let's begin. Um, uh, Jennifer, I'll start with you. If you could, well, actually, let's go across. Uh, if you guys could provide a little bit of depth as to who you're working with today and what exactly you're doing, say, at the University of Colorado, et cetera. 
So I'm a physical therapist, and uh, I run a, I, I oversee a group um, called the Restore Group at the University of Colorado that's focused entirely on how to maximize mobility in older adults. So we're looking at questions on a wide spectrum of, from, from patients who've been hospitalized to patients who want to go back to skiing and, and lots of recreational activities, all looking you know, very closely at ways we can speed up the recovery process and enhance the rehabilitation that people are, uh, are receiving. Bill, go ahead. I started in Aspen in 1990. I started off in uh, the Aspen Club, a physical therapy clinic, mostly working with orthopedic injuries. As we all live in Aspen, ski time, it's the ACL, back injuries. And through that time there, it was a blessing that I got to see patterns over and over and over. Why are there certain consistent patterns you see when someone might be tearing their ACL regularly? Or why are certain back things happening or hips? And that information and patterning those things helped me in my career moving on to sports performance. I was meeting a lot of athletes in different sports, from tennis to basketball and football, and doing a lot of traveling. But um, I kind of evolved into working with older folks. I've had some people in the audience have been with me for 30 years, and, and that's led into this concept now that we're all excited about is longevity. Can you continue to train at levels and move at levels that you did when you were younger and use what we know about the body, the body to sustain a high level of fitness and movement ability. I work at the Stedman Clinic and the Stedman Philippon Research Institute, which is uh, just down the block. Uh, we also have our mothership in Vail. Um, my training is in non-operative orthopedics, so my subspecialty is physical medicine rehabilitation. Uh, that's why Bill and I work so closely together. We're both focused on maximizing function then I have a fellowship in pain medicine, so we can use interventional tools, like, such as injections, to uh, help people maximize their level of function by decreasing their pain. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so Jennifer, just to start with you. Um, so Colorado ranks number two in terms of physical activity for adults age 65 plus. So number two in the nation. Um, we, we actually had the debate over what, who, who is number one. It's not mentioned in the report we had. Um, so if someone wants to uh, look that up and let us know, we're curious as well. Uh, but so given that, tell us about what happens as people age, what happens physically to them? You know, what is that process and sort of what are the implications on their physicality and functionality as they age? Yeah, there's a number of changes that happen with aging, um, and the biggest one is the loss of muscle strength or muscle mass. And after the age of 60 to 65, individuals lose a, a little bit less than 1% of their muscle mass per year, which translates to 2 to 3% loss of muscle strength. That's, when you're, that's assuming you're not actively trying to counter the, that loss, right? So you can certainly strengthen and build and exercise and prevent and slow that loss. That's probably one of the things that people notice the most. Um, there's certainly changes in balance and, and um, changes in um, sensory function, cardiovascular changes as well. Um, but the strength is one of the things that my group has been really focused on just because, you know, individuals go from one day being able to get out of a chair and the next day realizing that that, that threshold, we call it like the threshold of independence, suddenly they can no longer get out of that chair independently. And it happens quickly once you approach that threshold. And so how do you, how do you prevent that? How do you maintain muscle mass? How do you maintain muscle strength? Um, and the strength loss, it, it happens at a faster rate than muscle mass loss because you have neural contributions to strength. So it's not just the loss of the muscle tissue, but it's the inputs from the nervous system that stimulate the muscles to contract and you lose some of the the connections and the or the the ability to to recruit those muscles as efficiently so it's that combined loss of neuro and muscular um, uh, size that contributes to uh, that two to three percent loss in strength per year that's really interesting so it's not just the actual muscles themselves it's also the neural activity the brain is actually uh, causing diminishment um, uh, so bill do you have anything to add to that or yeah, first of all, this is an exciting time we're in where aging, the age science of aging and longevity is really exploding, and that's why it's so great we're having conversations on this. But just to build, and I love being on panels, because we, uh, 
you know, everything we talk about with muscle, the, uh, there was a book a while back I was involved with called Younger Next Year with Chris Crowley, and he had a fun way of describing aging in terms of the tide of aging, the combating aging. But as we talk about, it's the decay of all the systems of the body as you age. Um, from the system, the cardiovascular system, you get this, the smallest vessels in the body, the microcapillaries that provide oxygen and blood to your, your muscle tissues and organs, they shrink, they die without intervention. And as you, if you can't get oxygen and blood with all these growth nutrients, the tissue dies. Just think of a river and the tributaries. If the water doesn't push into the tributaries, the adjacent land becomes dry and dead, and so it is with the, the body. If you can't get blood and oxygen to your vital tissues, they die, and then you undergo its concept of, we talked about muscle atrophy. Sarcopenia is the term where you, you lose actual muscle mass. The protein synthesis, the ability to build muscle diminishes, and then what happens, you see physically, is the rate of force development, your speed, your power, your ability to exert tension is compromised. You can't control your bones well. If you can't put loads on your bone, what's the secondary thing you see from a bone perspective? Osteoporosis, right? You have to have the ability to exert force for your bones to adapt and grow new bone cells. The other thing that happens as muscle decays and it doesn't grow is you don't produce proteins in your blood, the growth hormone, testosterone, which indirectly is affected by other things, but you start to lose these hormones. So you decay from a hormone perspective. At the cellular level, where all the reactions where you produce energy, the mitochondria, some of you might have heard that term, those are the powerhouses in your cell where oxygen is utilized and energy is produced. You get all this decay from protein agglomeration, from food you eat over life and environmental toxins, and the factory shuts down so you can't produce energy as well, hence you're more tired. And that leads to other variables, brain cognitive function declines as you lose brain cells. Um, we talk, the big thing in the longevity industry now is the DNA, your, mic, you know, your, your genetic code, uh, the genome and the epigenome that turns genes off and on, that deregulates. And if you can't have the, per, the precise map of turning genes off and on, that regulate protein synthesis to build muscle, immune system repair to repair tissue, uh, inflammation control. Things just go wacky. It's kind of like the hardware system falls apart and the software doesn't run anymore. And then you have molecules in your cells. NAD is a big thing in the longevity thing. These living molecules control the regulation of your DNA and you lose half of that by the time you're 50. So there's this whole decay of aging. But what we're gonna talk about is lifestyle choices can influence that to the point you can halt it and in some cases even reverse it. And that's what I'm excited what we're gonna share some of our experiences and, and discussions and how we can actually impact the tide of aging and reverse it into a growth cycle. So I like ended the... on a positive note there. Yeah, um, very after, positive after note, yeah. Audience, yeah, yeah, sorry, there was, I was like, shall we go on? on? There is hope, there There's is hope. hope. <laughs> um, let's talk about reversing, because that's pretty compelling, that you can actually reverse the aging process. So to pivot to you, uh, Dusty, um, tell us about regenerative medicine, uh, which sounds related to reversal of some of these um, some of these activities in the body. Tell us about regenerative medicine and sort of what's on the cutting edge. What's the latest on that front? Absolutely. So <clears throat> I loved Bill's answer because he nailed it on a lot of fronts. Um, you know, taking a larger view of longevity, there's a diverse array of cellular and molecular mechanisms that contribute to decline over time. Uh, and we're starting to find certain mechanisms and switches that we can turn on and off and potentially reverse the aging process. So I'm really excited about it, and I think um, there's been a lot of new, new research in this space. Obviously, in orthopedics, we're invested in reversing knee osteoarthritis or hip osteoarthritis or tendinopathy. So that's where our focus generally has been. I think the term regenerative medicine is somewhat of a misnomer because we haven't generated the capacity to regenerate cartilage. Um, and that's kind of the holy grail of orthopedics at this point. If whoever does that will win a Nobel Prize. But we have found biologics and compounds that mitigate inflammation and change the milieu of what's going on in, let's say, the joint or at the cellular level. So uh, that generally breaks down into a few categories. Uh, PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, is one category. Uh, that's where you take your blood out, you put it in a centrifuge, you spin it down. This was uh, 
kind of conceived in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, because a very intelligent researcher noticed what happens when you bang your knee? What happens when you get hurt? You get redness and warmth and swelling, and why is that? That's, that's blood flow going to the area. Um, what's in the blood that's helping the healing process? They thought it was the red blood cells. It turns out it's actually the platelets. So there are growth factors and uh, hormones on the platelets that allow the tissue to regenerate. So we dialed that down a little further, and we looked at whether there were other compounds, leukocytes, which are white blood cells, either leukocyte-rich platelet-rich plasma or leukocyte-poor platelet-rich plasma, and started studying that. And like anything in medicine, initially we thought we could use it for everything. The truth is there's very specific indications, and we have to follow the evidence. So, you know, for knee osteoarthritis, works pretty darn well for mild to moderate knee arthritis. Once you get into the severe category, um, the biologics tend not to play out as well. The other big category, um, I would say, for regenerative medicine is stem cells. You've probably heard a lot about stem cells. Uh, they're cells that have the capacity to turn into different tissues. So I worked at the University of Wisconsin when I was an undergraduate in the lab next to James Thompson. He shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Nakayama on reverse engineering skin cells back into induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, which have the capacity to differentiate into different tissue. And so this is something I've been at for a while and been interested in for a while. Um, and stem cells are, are typically obtained from two sources. Either they're obtained from bone marrow or they're obtained, obtained from adipose tissue. Uh, we found moderate level evidence for Again, mild to moderate knee arthritis, just to keep that example going. And I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of ins and outs and permutations on, on stem cells that you need to be aware of. First, um, is it a good thing to put a cell that, in your body that can divide into anything? Um, turns out it's very safe, as long as you don't manipulate it, as long as you don't add anything to it, as long as you don't expand it. Um, and, you know, in Aspen, I have this conversation about once a week, you know, should I go to Costa Rica, should I go to Panama to get stem cells? Well, the FDA has specific rules on what we can do in this country based on safety data and efficacy data. Um, you can't expand the cells. And we found there's data out of Mayo uh, and data from the FDA that when you multiply a cell, it's called a passage, and by two or three passages, uh, the cells are kind of Frankenstein. They're, they're not... Uh, necessarily healthy. And the second thing is when you take a million cells and you turn it into 10 million, you do get more of the quote-unquote good, the anti-inflammatory anti modulation, but you also get more of the bad. Um, so I would say be cautious about going to Costa Rica, and I've had patients spend $30,000, $50,000 uh, to go to some of these clinics. Just do your research, uh, know what you're talking about. And I would say the most exciting thing is actually in the adipose, um, fat tissue, uh, we've been using bone marrow, and so when I do a stem cell injection, I drill into the pelvis, um, and it, it's a loud drill, so I'm sorry if some of you in the audience have experienced that, but, uh, and then we spin it down and we re-inject. You can actually obtain stem cells in a higher quantity uh, from fat tissue, so that's a new avenue of research that we're looking into, um, and I think it potentially has a lot of promise. Really interesting, so you're saying do your research before you go to Costa Rica or Panama for a medical procedure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. You'd be um, surprised, Lee. <laughs> yes. And hey, I see some people raising their hands. Maybe with it, they have questions. Uh, we're gonna do an audience Q and A after uh, after we do um, some of this back and forth in the panel. So just um, note to self there. Um, so uh, Jennifer, you've talked about uh, gate speed and how you can maybe quantify it to determine or to predict how, how long someone will age, how long someone will live. Tell us about that, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, so um, Stephanie Studinsky at the University of Pittsburgh a number of years ago published an article that um, they had looked at 35, almost 35,000 people, older adults in community dwelling um, environments, and they looked at their gait speed and they looked at how long they, were, they lived. Um, and so they monitored people over time. There are a number of studies that kind of have su further supported some of this work, but gait speed is remarkably predictive of mortality. Um, and the reason is, it's a measure of a lot of systemic inputs. So I was watching all of you coming in, watching how fast you were walking, <laughs> and I'm guessing that you're gonna be walking a lot faster to your cars on the way out. Um, but it is very predictive of mortality. 
And it turns out that when you have a change in your gait speed, a lot of times that's more detectable than the underlying medical condition that might be contributing to that change in gait speed. Um, and it might be that you have three things that are contributing um, to a decline in gait speed, and by themselves, you wouldn't identify each one until they become more obvious or a bit more prominent. But together, they, they can slow someone's gait speed down. Um, so it's, it's remarkably predictive. The good news is, it's also reversible. So we know that people, there was a study, they looked at individuals over nine years, and um, they actually looked very closely in the first year at whether or not their gait speed increased, went up and down, so transiently improved and declined, or declined. So three categories. You either increased, you kind of went up and down, or you declined. And it was remarkably predictive nine years later of the percentage of those individuals that were still alive. So if you improved your gait speed, you had a greater chance of being alive nine years later. If you went up and down, you were kind of in the middle. There's, I think it like, goes like 70%, 60%, and then 50% of individuals were alive 50 years, uh, 50 years. nine years later um, if your gait speed had declined during that first year. So it's, it's really an interesting measure because um, it does take into all these different, into these, these different factors. And I've had people, I had one um, person we have, we, I present often on gate speed and some of the predictions and, and the analytics associated with it. And so they installed a gate speed sensor in their parents' um, hallway. <laughs> and, and you don't need something that sophisticated. You can take your phone, you can download an app that will measure your gait speed. You mark out a four meter walkway and you can time how fast you're walking. Um, but they had, done, they had gone to the lengths of um, having a sensor system installed in the hallway of their um, apartment complex. Wow. And they noticed one day that their, their um, loved one's gait speed had, had declined. We say 0.1 meters per second or more change is a decline. Um, and that, that value is linked to lots of, you know, higher risk for rehospitalizations and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of data to say 0.1 meters per second is kind of that threshold. And they saw that decline and um, took their loved one into the physician's office who diagnosed them with, with a medical condition that was intervenable upon. Um, but they were able to detect that earlier than they might have otherwise. So it's a very simple measure but it's highly predictive of lots of other things. And, and the good thing is you can do something about improving it. You can strength train, you can, do, you can exercise, you can do lots of things to preserve your gait speed. That's amazing. That's amazing that that research is out there. Um, so again, I think it's really compelling that even though there are these sort of uh, forces uh, that maybe um, you know, can cause some decline, that you're able to reverse them. So, one of our goals here, just convening tonight, is to pass along some tips, tricks, you know, advice, suggestions for how you can go home and you know, actually work to reverse some of these forces of nature that are out there. So on that topic, uh, Bill, um, there are different exercises we all do. And there are a million different viewpoints on you know, doing yoga, doing Pilates, yeah. right? Uh, walking every day, um, or going beyond that. What do you advise people to do to focus on to really counteract those forces? What, they should, be, what should they be doing? Yeah. Well, first, to Jen point, I think the, the point there is the body, the nervous system in particular, is very adaptable. And that is an incredible thing that we can all make changes. It's, 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 it's beautiful. In turn, I think the first thing regarding the question is, you know, obviously my general answer is do what you're passionate about because that's what you're going to do. But, um, there should be some definition in defining what is strength training, what is strength. And if you read a, uh, any type of just workbook, you probably get 20 different answers. What I've evolved strength to be is the ability to project force through the body. And that can be picking up groceries and putting them over your head, the ability to get into a low position, pick the weight up and lift it up. It could be serving a tennis ball. So there's different forms of strength. There's speed strength, like watching Roger Federer serve a tennis ball which is very different than watching an Olympic lifter lift 300 pounds off the ground. That is a different form of strength, maximizing the weight, you know, heavy weights. Strength, but the one thing they all have in common, whether you're using yoga or Pilates or weights, you are projecting force through the body. The question is, how well can you project that force through the body, which is a function of multiple variables, flexibility. If you can't get into low positions with good posture, 
you can't move well. You round your back. Some of the hardest athletes I've ever worked with or try to help are ex-bodybuilders who are big and bulky, but they don't have any hip mobility. So when I have them try to pick something off the ground, they round or their shoulder, or they've lost shoulder motion from years of just doing bench pressing. And they have these, so flexibility is critical. Well, what's what great avenue to great develop flexibility? Things like yoga. Core stability is essential because if you can't control your spine position, you dump into bad postures, you hyperextend, you hyperflex. Pilates is a great form to develop the stability to control your spine, which feeds nicely into other forms of strength training, whether you're using weights or doing versions of track and field. Anything that can help you project force through the body efficiently is going to work well. Now, here's the one thing with age, though, that I've added to that. There's different muscle fiber types. There's your aerobic muscle fiber types, type one. And if your goal is just to have flexibility and move better, something like yoga will do very well. However, to get into these type two fibers, which are your bigger, thicker fibers, which are more responsible for creating force and tension ability and size and development, and as you develop muscle fibers, there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, the, you know, it's not just the muscle itself, it's bone, you create more bone as you use your muscles, but there's hormonal changes in the body. There's nervous system changes. As you work heavier weights, you start to recruit more muscle mass and you start to have other changes. Nervous system wise, you, your nervous system lights up like, a, like a, a light switch, lighting up more lights, the voltage goes up. These are all positive adaptations in your body that affect every system in your body, from your hormones, to your brain activity, to your brain cells. There's this whole array of, of things that happen. So to get into these higher type two fibers, you have to go a little heavier. You just have to do it safely, and that's where coaching is involved. You might also have to enhance velocity, moving quicker, jumping, things like that. Of course, that requires training. You just want to take someone who doesn't have any experience jumping, an 80-year-old person, and have them jump. Many of my clients who are 80 are jumping and they're doing ski drills, but they've been doing it for 30 years. You know? So it's, it's all about proper coaching and adapting into higher thresholds of movement. But, but the general answer is they all have a purpose. Whatever genre you like, yoga, Pilates, strength training with weights, CrossFit, um, running at the track, they, they all have a purpose of coming together. It's just what is your objective? And if, if you want to really highlight the benefits of trying to stay with some muscle mass, it requires just a, a little bit more higher threshold of pushing the body with a little bit more weight. It can be your body weight or a little bit more speed. Those things so you can project force better, faster, be more explosive, reduce your risk of falling improve your reflexes and reactions. It's just a little higher threshold that you might need beyond something than just say yoga or Pilates. So can, to, oh, yeah, please, can please, I add yeah. to that? Just yeah, please, that, was, that was an excellent explanation. One of the things that I see a lot is when it comes to strength training and targeting those type two muscle fibers, those are the ones that are predominantly in your quads and your hamstrings and some muscles in your calves and, and your biceps. And these are the, the power producing kind of muscles um, that, that are essential to, to maintain as, as, as you age. And one of the things that we see people do is 30 repetitions of a squat isn't going to necessarily build strength to the same degree as eight repetitions at a higher weight where you actually can't do the ninth repetition. So more is better in terms of weight, but less repetitions. And I see this a lot, and we train our therapists, if a patient can do more than eight, up the weight or the level of difficulty. And so that way we're really training into a zone that builds muscle mass, that actually hypertrophies the muscle, if that's the goal. If you're training your core muscles, you want endurance. You want, you want um, to be able to sustain and you want to be able to do more repetitions with lesser weights and, and be able to, to, to develop those type one muscle fibers in your core musculature. But if you're talking about a lot of these power producing muscles, if you can do more than eight repetitions, up the weight. And generally the vagueness in that is both of us come at it from a, a medical physical therapy background is the other question we always have to ask is what is the margin of safety? And that's the question Dusty has to deal with every day because if he's gonna inject someone with their spine because they've got a degenerative disc 
and we try to have them do weight training and they're not prepared for that, they can get hurt. So you have to have those elements of the proper flexibility, motion at the right joints at the right time, stability of the core, and then we can load you safely. It's all about how can you load someone safely, whether it's with weight or with speed training. Um, it's, it's the margin of safety. And if, if you train properly over time, the window expands dramatically. And it's we're, we somewhat can become unlimited in the way we train you, even at 80, 85 years old. So there's something I want to unpack there, because I, I find this really interesting as well. Um, so there's the, uh, uh, there's the fast twitch muscles that it seems like if you can penetrate, if you can do the right resistance to, um, it, uh, to activate those fibers, um, there, there are other benefits. What are those benefits? Um, another way of putting this is why would someone, you know, um, uh, it's harder to work out that way. So what are the incentives? I mean, what can someone expect to get out of it, either cognitively, physically, uh, with respect to longevity, what happens when they really start engaging those muscles? And let's say they're seven years old. Um, I, I'll, I'll let you start. With that. Okay. Yeah. So again, from the nervous system perspective, as you engage these these thicker diameter fibers that can generate more force, it requires again the voltage, the the central nervous system, brain to spinal cord to the peripheral nervous system you recruit more fibers. You train your body to recruit more fibers at once, which means what? Your reflexes of reactions are heightened. You move faster, it correlates to a better gait, it correlates to speed. You ever see a sprinter, what a sprinter looks like? You know, even a young, I mean, they're ripped and they're lean and they have the most beautiful posture. I love watching track and field athletes, that aesthetics. Now, and even though we can't go back and quite look the way we did when we were 25 years old, there's something to be said about training like that with speed and power to, to, to turn on the light switch in our body. And that indirectly turns on the hormonals. So you have growth hormone, which stimulates with vasodilation. Every, I call it, you know, I always say someday I'm going to write a, a book on most of this, and I'm going to call it All Systems Go. Because what happens is every system in your body kicks in, nervous system, brain, cognitive function. Navigating your body through space with force and speed is highly challenging and, and the parts of the brain, the frontal cortex that maps motion. You produce brain cells. It's, it's remarkable how every system turns on as you load the body, it, but it has to be loaded safely. You have to have the margin of safety to do that. That goes back to, again, balance, flexibility, stability, good posture. These are the foundations of movement. When you have these things, the sky is the limit. You can load, and you can load with speed, you can load with balance challenge, you can load with weight, you can load with all different types of resistances from tubing to dumbbells to barbells. It's remarkable what you can do with the right training and the right foundation. Please. Well said. I can't top that. So uh, I think yeah. I think we'll leave we'll leave it at that. I, I, well, I guess I could say one thing. I agree 100% with everything you said. Um, we're also doing kind of high intensity resistance training with this eight to failure principle in individuals who are in nursing facilities, right? So these are individuals who don't always have the flexibility and all these things. We have to be very careful, like you said. Um, but we've been very successful at reversing some of the problems associated with aging, even in individuals who have significant declines in mobility. Um, we've, we've taken individuals who are 95 years old and put weight vests on them and taught them how to do sit to stand activities so that they can strength, strengthen and train the, the muscles in their legs and they tolerate it really well. But you're absolutely right about everything you've said about the f flexibility and the form and all those things are important to prevent injury um, and being able to, to balance and, and, and um, those competing priorities. Yes. I find that fascinating. Weight vests on on older adults in senior housing setting. That's really really impressive. Not even senior <laughs> housing, but like these are people who've been hospitalized and are, you know, can you know they're building back their their strength, right? And and that's great they're, to know. They're capable. Um, uh, okay, so Dusty, um, you work with a research group at Stedman. It's part of of what you're doing, and I know that um, one area that you're focused on is the concept of of senescence. If you could tell us about senescence, what that is, and uh, also um, let us know what you're researching. I think there are some compounds that you've discovered that have an interesting impact. 
Yeah, I think senescence is a, a fantastic mechanism that we can Im implement to reverse aging. Um, most of the work has been done by Dr. Heward, who's our chief scientific officer. He's a fantastic mind. And I just want to say from a high level, it's one of the mechanisms of aging. There's, there's so many mechanisms that contribute, but we found that this is one of those switches that we can potentially flip. Um, so senescence is Latin to sleep, um, and we found that there's these cells. Uh, most cells undergo 12 to 15 divisions, and then they're recycled by the body, the circle of life. Um, but we found that there's a percentage of cells that stop replicating and stop functioning as a part of the system, and they kind of fade into the background. And they're actually hard to detect. Uh, we've figured out a method to detect them and stain them and uh, realize that they're not so benign. These aren't cells that have just retired and went to Aspen to have fun and ski. <laughs> These are cells that are actually quite toxic. Uh, they release inflammatory mediators. Um, they're like the car on the side of the road that's just spewing smoke into the air. And they're, they're really associated with a lot of bad things. So this is, again, research out of the Mayo Clinic, some of the stuff that we've done. But there's an association between senescent cells and Alzheimer's and dementia. There's an association between cardiovascular disease. There's an association with osteoarthritis. So it seems like there's potentially this one little central mechanism that has all these spokes um, that could be contributing to aging in general. Obviously, we're focused on leveraging that for orthopedics. So we started looking at a way. At first, how do you detect these cells? Um, it turns out there's a cell differentiator, a CD marker, um, that you can use to detect senescent cells. So you know that took, what, a couple of years to, to figure that out. And then uh, we started looking at measuring those in different populations. So taking people from 0 to 100 and um, measuring how many senescent cells. And guess what? There's almost a linear relationship between how old you are and how many senescent cells you accumulate in your body. So this is how science works. We start, can we detect it reliably? Can we measure it reliably? Is there an association with aging? Now we're look, next step was to look at, can we decrease it? So we took about 12 different compounds and we tested all of them. And, and one in particular I'll highlight tonight. Um, and we put patients uh, through the ringer and had them take the supplement, measured their blood before, measured their blood after, and we found out we could decrease their level of senescent cells by, on average, 93%. Um, basic, it, it's a plant-based flavonoid. It's, the compound is called fisetin. Um, you can take it at low doses. Um, it's derived from strawberries. Uh, very few side effects, if any. And um, the next step is to say, all right, can we prove to the scientific community that this works and publish a paper that everyone's going to believe and they can critique it to their heart's content? So currently, we are doing a randomized controlled clinical trial. It's active and live here in Basalt and Aspen, um, where we have different dosing regimens that you come into the study. You don't know what you're getting. I don't know what you're getting. Only the researchers know what you're getting. And we measure your senescent cells at different intervals and see if there's a dose effect or an effect of a certain dose versus placebo. So it's, a, it's an elegant study. It's safe. Um, we, I think we still have a few spots left if anyone's interested in talking to me after the study. Um, but uh, it's, we're hoping that we can lend more credence to our hypothesis that um, we can use this compound to decrease senescence. That's not the end of the work. You know, the work in science, you, you're drilling, and then you just keep drilling, and then you just keep drilling further. Um, so we're hoping to leverage that for, you know, outcomes after knee replacement, um, enhance the efficacy of the injections we do, enhance the efficacy of the biologics, the PRP and the stem cell that we use. Um, and there's so much interesting data. We have uh, data on basically cleaning your cells. So we talked earlier about how you can't take your cells out of your body, like if you're taking stem cells, you can't take them out of your body and manipulate them or add anything to it. Um, but there's no rule that you can't enrich the soil beforehand. So you know, one study that I'm really interested in doing is uh, putting, putting people on a program before we draw their bone marrow or draw their adipose tissue and then testing it against a control group and, and seeing if there's a difference in the quality. Because if I had, for instance, a 93-year-old patient, one of my best friends, funny to say he actually is, <laughs> I'm going to the East Coast to visit him, uh, all he wants to do is play tennis all day. If he's playing tennis, he's a happy camper. And he had a wrist problem, and he, absolutely not a surgical candidate, uh, has tried everything under the sun, steroids were not working. And we had a conversation, I said, my friend, you're you know, 90 some years old, and your cells are 90 some years old. 
Um, and you know, I said, wouldn't it be great if we could make your cells look 18 years old and then put them back in your body? So I think that's one of our potential future directions. Uh, I hope I answered your question somewhere there in there, Lee. <laughs> no, that was really good. Um, so if I'm understanding clearly, um, you're doing research on a compound called fisetin, right? And um, the, the idea, the hypothesis is that it will um, uh, enhance outcomes for people recovering from injury. Does it have any potential for people that aren't injured and just want to utilize the supplement to, for the you know, anti-senescent benefits? That's a great question. I, I think we have, a, the data is robust enough for me to tell you, I know it can reduce your senescent cells, but the data is not robust to me, enough for me to say, I know this is gonna help you with your pain, or I know this is gonna help you with your memory, or I know this is gonna help you with your heart. That's kind of the next step and the next phase. Um, so we're, if we cross this threshold and, and publish this data, I think we can start to venture into that territory. But in science, to make a claim, you know, anything that we say on the stage, it's backed up by strong evidence. And evidence that we can be criticized by you know, our jury, or the jury of our peers. Um, so we look at, at things in terms of quality of evidence, and we always look for high quality evidence, meaning, um, you could publish it and someone in Kazakhstan or Australia or London could look at it and say, that's a high quality study. They did everything by the book, they did it perfectly, and they proved objectively that it works. Science is not something you can just uh, live, on, live on a wing in a dream. You have to be able to replicate it. So if I did a study and someone in 10 years in India wants to do the same study, they should get the same results if, if, if you know, what we did was true. Uh, it's good to know. So there's obviously a lot of scientific rigor that goes into any, you know, anything that you mention about this. Um, so, uh, Bill, there's something that I've recently come across, um, and I know you're familiar with it, is uh, blood flow restriction training, BFR training. Now, I don't know if anyone in the audience has heard of this. Um, there's sort of uh, yeah. some literature out there. Can you tell us what yeah. that is? And Show of hands, anyone has used B BFR in the audience? A few of you, yeah. Yeah, it's a Japanese uh, uh, history with it, um, and it kind of feeds into the topics Jennifer and I have been talking about of how you can, with loading, recruit. There's two ways you can get into these fast twitch muscle fibers. One is pushing your body with a heavier weight, and, and the, sec the second and third is pushing towards failure, because the body works in a principle of small to large fibers. So you recruit all the small ones before you get to the big ones, the fast twitch ones. The other way, and this is where BFR, blood flow resistance, comes in, is metabolically. You create, and you have, we've all worked out and hiked a mountain or skied down where you get that lactate burn in your thighs. So visualize you have a tourniquet. You know, and I'm exactly, you never want to tighten these things to the point of tourniquet, but you're creating a backflow of blood. It's a strap, two straps, you pump them up. For the legs, it's about 300 pounds of pressure. The shoulder's about 250. And it creates a backflow of blood as you're exercising. That creates a lack of oxygen. It creates lactate buildup in your blood. Acidosis. As your blood becomes as, uh, you know, acidic, it correlates with growth hormone. It correlates with a lot of protein elements, synthesis, that leads to growth, the opposite of decay, combating the tide of aging. So through these exercises, and the reps with metabolic training are higher. You don't have to use as heavy of a load which works really good with injury, because it, or just in general, because if you can't load because of an injury or you have arthritis in your knee, you have to go lighter weights. But another, the substitute way of working around that to get into these type two fibers and create more growth is metabolically. So you create this backflow of blood in your legs or your arms, and you create these growth factors that lead to muscle development, greater size, and all the positive benefits we've talked about that go with muscle development, from improved force output, improved balance, improved reflexes and reactions. Um, it's an incredible tool. We use it a lot in the rehab, but I use it with a lot of my, my strength athletes. The US ski team is really big on this. Bodie Miller loves BFR training. He used a little quite a bit. Um, cyclists are using it. Some of the top national cyclists are using it. They do 20 minutes of spin on a bike and their legs, they create all these enzyme adaptations in their muscles so they can flush out lactate. And if you can flush out lactate quicker and better, 
you perform at a much higher level and you have an advantage over your competitors. So a lot of applications to it, but an incredible aging, you know, for combating the tide of the aging tool. Yeah, I often describe it as, you know, you're tricking your body into thinking you've hit that failure point. You're essentially making the body think that it needs to generate more muscle tissue to not hit that failure point or that lactic acid buildup. So you're essentially overriding the natural process. Yeah. Um, and and it, it does seem to be very effective in, in many populations. However, we were talking earlier about it's, it's something that does require some supervision. You can't just, you can go out there and you can get, you can buy a BFR cuff, but there are pressures and different things that you should be considering as far as limits and, and guidelines. Um, so it's not something that one should be cautious about just going out and, and, and using it um, without any um, knowledge or, or, yeah. or experience. In the fitness field, is, is, and we're a very fit audience, everything's in trends. It's like, oh, BFR is the new big thing. Are you doing your BFR? And then, you know, and then it switches to something else the next week, uh, electromuscular stimulation. Are you doing this? And then, you know, everything goes in trends. And, and in the end, they're just tools. There's always going to be a different trend. It's how you use it, and it's a tool that can be used positively to improve the way your body functions, to get stronger, to combat the tide of aging. In the end, it just requires good coaching and, and proper, proper education, and you get great benefits with it. So if I'm understanding correctly, when you do BFR training, um, you trick your body into uh, thinking that it's sort of reached that failure point. And uh, Bill, you were mentioning that, so the, the, the acidity of the blood, the lactic acid that builds up, that burn mm -hmm. that I can't stand, but you know, no pain, no gain. Yeah. Um, when that happens, that's sort of where the magic is. Am I wrong on that? No, you're correct. That's, and, and that's why, again, back to, and, and you know, and, and that's, you can, you can go with lighter loads because you're creating a backflow of, uh, of lactate, but that's where the blood is acidic. As the blood is acidic, you create all these enzymes. Enzymes are organic compounds, proteins that are involved with chemical reactions that produce growth, cellular respiration, back to your mitochondria function, producing energy. All these things go on the rise, so you can produce more energy, you get all these adaptations, but the one that's really, I think, relevant, that, you know, if I had to pick at the top of the list, it's things, hormones, growth hormone. And that doesn't just stay localized to your thigh, or if you're doing leg training, it circulates through your body, and growth hormone has incredible impacts on growth, cellular reproduction, tissue repair, um, you know, wound healing. It's, it's dramatic, and not to mention you know, the nervous system adaptations as well. So just by, that's why the point is you hit it, no pain, no gain. There's gotta be some pain involved. But it's not joint, where, you know, we wanna distinguish, it's not, it shouldn't be joint pain. If your knee is killing you after you do this, you gotta stop. It's the lactate pain that's temporary that produces these changes. And then, of course, you cycle it out or you move and the lactate flushes out. So I've got one more question, and then after that, we can flip to an audience Q&A. Uh, there's a mic on either end, in either aisle. Um, and uh, so I just want to kind of go down uh, the panel here. Um, there's another kind of uh, new, I don't know if this is just a temporary trend or if there's something really there, maybe you can help answer this, but cold exposure. I've heard about it, I've read a lot about it, cold exposure going into very, very cold water. What happens there? What do you guys know about that? And should people, should older adults be trying this out to see if they can um, achieve the same benefits? Well, it's, it's, it's cold exposure, and interestingly enough, there's also heat exposure, too, that's thought to, to be protective. So, like, sauna therapy, you know, like, they've, they've done studies, and they've, they're starting to see patterns and trends that, that, that also may be therapeutic and beneficial. Um, but, but in terms of the cold therapy, um, Bill is our physiologic, phys physiology <laughs> expert in terms of the mechanisms of how that's actually working. But, again, building that resilience, like, almost looking at you know, failure in a different way, yeah. like the extremes and building the, the body's capacity to bounce back mm -hmm. increases that plasticity inherently, the ability to, to just um, to adapt, essentially, mm -hmm. by going to either extreme. Yeah, and I'm, I am, yeah, I'm a geek when it comes to this stuff. I find it fascinating, and I can't dive into it enough. So uh, 
Wim Hof, are some of you familiar with Wim Hof, the crazy guy, the European who hikes up Mount Everest in his shorts and can control his blood body temperature, you know, and you know, he has this whole thing. And it, it, it correlates also with the Navy SEALs, these guys who are doing incredible things. Uh, so the, the physiology, so to speak, and I find this fascinating, so I'll share with you. Our nervous system, you have a sympathetic drive and a parasympathetic drive. Sympathetic drive, evolutionary, is what we needed when we were being chased by a, a lion or a dinosaur or whatever, you know, to get the point. The fight or flight response, where your adrenaline goes up and your hormones and your blood vessels constrict. And, it, and it's good, you need these fight or flight response and you get greater muscle activation. It was a survival mechanism. And then the parasympathetic, which we do in meditation, the breathing and it vasodilates your arteries and it's healthy, it's anti-inflammatory. So what cold exposure provides is an opportunity to go into a sympathetic drive. Because when you get in a cold plunge or jump in a river, your body goes right to sympathetic drive, right? We've done it. You're in fight or flight mode. You're like, oh crap, get me the heck out of here. You're sh so it's a training tool to do what? How quickly, like a Navy SEAL, can you go into parasympathetic mode? Can you control your breath? Can you get your vasodilation? Can you get oxygen, which is you know, the molecule that is energy? Can you, can you create the heat in a cold environment, which someone like Winhoff can do with ease? But he's taught people to do it. So you train yourself, in, in this, especially in our society, where we're always in a little bit of sympathetic drive, social media, whatever which we know is bad for us. Chronic stress is one of the leading things that accelerates aging. So it's a training tool to learn how to go into parasympathetic mode. And the cold benefits, you know, if you can, it's not the cold itself, it's the training benefit of getting into parasympathetic mode while you're in the cold. And if you can learn to do that, that has incredible transfer into your life and all these other benefits of the way, again, all systems go that I talked about earlier. But that's the thing of it. And, and Wim Hof, of course, has made this famous, where you can go take a Wim Hof class and jump into a plunge and learn how to control your breathing. And you leave there, and you feel like Superman. <laughs> but it's, it's incredible. Here we have the rivers, and I see people in the rivers all the time doing it. But uh, even if you don't use cold exposure, there's something to be said about breath work. And, and some of you, if anyone read James Nestor book, um, Breath, I recommend it strongly. It talks about the power of learning to use oxygen in your body, just breathing, and the ability to go parasympathetic, and the benefit of energy exchange of oxygen for every cell in your body, and the benefits of oxygen. Um, it's a fascinating book on just the simplicity of breath work, and you can use that in your training, as for strength training, for recovery, but uh, in a society where we live, where we're not even breathing half the time, and we don't know it, we're sitting at our computer holding our breath, we're in sympathetic mode. Moving back into that parasympathetic mode, improving our lung capacity, our ability to use oxygen is one of the most important things we can do to enhance lifespan. One more question, um, just gave me a thought. Uh, so Dustin, um, speaking of books, um, are there one or two books that you would recommend for the audience on the topic of either regenerative medicine, senescence, reversing aging, fitness, what comes to mind? Yeah, 100%. So top two would probably be, I think it's Why We Age by David Sinclair. Yeah. Um, he's done probably the most uh, comprehensive work on longevity. Uh, he's out of Harvard and uh, internationally renowned researcher and does things at a high level, but also explains them at a level I can understand. Uh, and then the other book, it sounds... I would say this is directly related to longevity in the sense that it's about the human project, you know, over the last few thousand years. Uh, Enlightenment Now uh, by Steven Pinker. Uh, Bill Gates said it's one of the best books he's, he's ever read, top five. Um, I would agree with that. It's basically about how we can use the principles of the Enlightenment, reason, science, humanism, and progress to um, enhance human society and how we have enhanced human society. I think it's just important from a historical perspective to look at, you know, what did you do when you had knee arthritis, you know, 100 years ago? You did nothing. You suffered and you died. Uh, and what did you do 50 years ago? You still suffered quite a lot, but you maybe lived a little longer. And you know, now we have a knee replacement. 
which is fantastic. Um, but there are risks associated with that. So what's in the future? Well, hopefully we can restore your native cartilage and get you back to, to your knee feeling like it's 18. So it gives you kind of a nice spectrum uh, on the timeline of humanity of how far we've come, which is really easy to lose sight of. I don't think that will stop us from pushing where we want to go, but uh, those would be the two I'd recommend. Interesting. Bill? A James Nestor book, I think, uh, Breath is highly recommended. Um, in terms of uh, lifespan, I, I recently wanted the longevity code. Uh, that's the one that will talk about the DNA regulation, the epigenome that controls your gene expression, protein agglomeration, the benefits of fasting to remove the excessive protein in your body that is clogging up your mitochondria from producing energy. Uh, it talks about the different things that cause the decay of the body in aging and things you can do about it. And of course it gets into, and I talked to Lee about this earlier, if we get into nutrition and we'll hijack the conversation because I've never had a, a panel discussion where once nutrition comes on board, it's like, okay, we're going down this route, vegetarian, meat eaters. But it gets into that element of the different types of proteins that you get in vegetables versus meats and how that affects the body. But the longevity code, I think it's a fantastic book. Jennifer. I guess as a, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, we were talking about earlier, the National Geographic special um, that we were, that it, as an alternative to a book, if you choose a different form of media, um, it's on Netflix, it's on you know, a variety of different sources. What's that? Blue Zones blue is zone. one of them, but there was another one, I, I think it, um, there was a, there on a, specifically on aging, going through like uh, cold baths to, um, to uh, fasting, to strengthening, like kind of a wide range of, of things you can do to prevent aging um, through National Geographic. And um, I thought it was very well done at a very lay audience, but very informative, very scientifically based um, way of, of presenting kind of some of the, some of the counter, counter options to aging. So it's a National Geographic like documentary. It's a series, yeah, documentary series. series. Does anybody? Limitless. What's it? Limitless. Limitless, yes, that, that is, yes. I like the title. Yes. Limitless, yes. Thank okay, you. Watch it. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so there's two mics. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Yes, please go to mics. Um, there's a mic over there, and there's a mic right there. Sir, I'll start with you. Yeah, what type of aerobic activity and how much fits into the whole scheme of what you do? Yeah, you know, the, um, the guidelines for aerobic exercise are 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week at a moderate um, intensity. Um, and so that's kind of a starting point, you know, for aerobic exercise. And you can go up from there, but trying to figure out how you can get um, you know, that, that base with through, like Bill was saying, however, whatever you enjoy doing, because it doesn't matter whether it's biking or swimming or running or, you know, you name it. Um, it's about just getting that, that heart rate up for a sustained period of time. Um, there is more and more evidence suggesting that you can do more interval based training as well. And for shorter periods of time, and, and maybe Bill, you can comment on this, but where you can really go up to 90% of your max heart rate, or uh, you know, in that 80 to 90% range for 30 to 60 seconds, and then drop back down, and you can do it in shorter periods of time and potentially achieve the same benefits. I agree that one of the benefits of doing some anaerobic training, as we talked about again, when you go anaerobic generally you're going with greater intensity, right? So say you're walking up Aspen Mountain, you might be in the aerobic zone where you might be at 70% of your max heart rate, what we call below anaerobic uh, threshold. But what happens if you were to sprint for 20 seconds and your heart rate is up, but just that sprint does what? What changes at the cellular level, muscle fiber level? You go from type one at some point to type two fiber development, and you get the benefits of all that strength, you know, the, it's, it's a, you know, where you cross the line between, is it strength training or is it just high intensity cardiovascular training? The point is you switch over eventually when you fatigue the slow twitch fibers, you're gonna go into fast twitch fiber recruitment and you get that benefit of that muscle, lean muscle mass development when you push at higher intensities. And that, that has massive benefits. So you can get the best of both worlds. I think in Aspen what we find is 
Some of us just like to go for our long, slow bike ride on Saturday. But during the week, we might say, okay, I'm gonna throw some intervals in. And it, you know, the same with your hike. You go for that nice, slow hike, and other days you're like, okay, I'm gonna sprint for a few seconds. You can do both and have a good time doing it. Go ahead. I wanna thank the participants for coming here tonight. I think it's been very informative. Um, I do have a medical background, somewhat aged. Um, I was first wondering about you mentioning a study you were doing with the strawberry um, flavonoid. I'd be really curious as if there was an opening and I would qualify as a um, participant volunteer. I would love to do that. Um, and I don't know who to contact or the people. I'll, uh, I'll send the contact to Lee and we can get it out to the audience and okay. just disseminate it that way. Uh, and my question is, okay, this, this comes like back in the 80s. When I started, I was a lab tech. And I was in Steamboat. And there's very serious athletes there also. And you wouldn't believe the amount of people that wanted me to blood dope. Okay. Um, so I started relating that to your senescence cell, and the inflammation factors that are in the body, or would it be good to flush them out? Um, I guess my question is, if you're using stem cells that has a totipotency, um, they're undifferentiated, meaning they, you don't know what kind of tissue or cell they're going to develop into, um, if that would interfere with the uh, totipotency the, and the growth hormone factor um, because that protein is circulating in the blood. I, ho I hope I'm describing this correctly because this is a little bit above um, my, my personal knowledge, let's say. Just to clarify, you're asking if the anti-senescent agent would impact the potency of the stem cell? Yes. Okay. So I think, uh, I'm so glad you asked this question. It's like the perfect little springboard. Um, so first of all, there's, again, totipotent cells, which, you know, uh, can differentiate into any tissue, total potency. There's pluripotent, meaning plural, so they can differentiate into specific tissues, and there's different lineages of cells. So... Um, you know, I worked with embryonic stem cells at, at University of Wisconsin, and um, and then Bush implemented a law, and uh, I love them dearly, but we had to flush them down the drain. Um, and then, um, uh, but anyways, that's neither here nor there. So the pluripotent cells um, are typically w w what we can induce, so we can reverse tissues into. Um, but they can't turn into anything. And then there's lineages. So the mesodermal line lineage in orthopedics is muscle and bone tissue. Um, and so we think that that lineage is going to be most applicable to uh, joint problems and things in orthopedics. Um, that would be, again, the bone marrow or the fat. I don't have any reason to believe that if we eliminate senescent cells, it's going to impact the, quote unquote, potency of, of the signaling cells. The truth is I don't necessarily want what we're calling stem cells to turn into other tissue. I've been using that term and you know that's another misnomer. The, a better term for it is medicinal signaling cells. So MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells. Um, it was uh, uh, Kirkland, Dr. Kirkland out of Mayo who originally coined that term and he, he published a, a paper basically redacting it and saying they're not technically stem cells. I don't want to get into the ins and outs of that. Uh, they're more medicinal signaling cells. That will, that's what we're using them for. They're, we really want the anti-inflammatory milieu. Um, one metaphor that I've used with the patient is, you know, you've got your elbow joint, for instance, and it blew up because you fell in a crash. And it's like having a, a, a troops in Ukraine. And the lights go out, and Starlink goes down, and the radios aren't working, and there's a battle and it's total chaos and confusion. It's basically what happens when you have a joint that's degenerative. Um, and you know what we're doing with stem cells is putting generals on the field to help dictate and signal. They're very smart. You can't beat you know, a couple billion years of evolution. They're smart cells. They dictate 
anti-inflammatory properties. These cells need to come and heal this. You guys need to start communicating. And so it, it brings this level of communication that's more sophisticated than anything human beings will ever create, uh, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. I hope that answered your question. I don't, I don't, I, I, I slipped it in there. I don't think the antisenescent properties will impact uh, the stem cells. In fact, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, two comment, two questions. One, this is an awful lot for all of us to digest. Uh, so, <laughs> is there one-stop shopping? Can we go to Stedman and have a longevity coach? Can we have someone that's going to look at all my blood and look at? what I do daily and say, okay, you need to kick up the cardio, you need to lift heavy weights. Uh, is there one-stop shopping? Because I, I will be dead before I understand all this. <laughs> well, we'll just give you some compounds to make you live 20 years longer. Is that enough time? To... <laughs> so, good question. There are some private companies out there that are selling packages, so to speak, and I've heard, again, a wide range, $10,000 for a single visit, and then you know, up to $100,000 for a premium platinum membership. Um, and I don't mean to be critical. I, I'm, I would say academically, no one's doing it because it's all siloed and no one's really communicating. And I think your question really speaks to the challenge of it, is you need different disciplines with deep areas of expertise. You need someone like me, you need someone like Bill, and Jen, and, and, and more than that, um, to really implement it at a high level. So I'd say we're in the early phases, but I do expect, you know, in the next 10 years or so, these, these uh, groups are gonna become more sophisticated and there are gonna be evidence-based methods that apply to the aging mechanisms across different dimensions that help uh, longevity. Okay, my second comment or question is this. I got hooked, don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, listening to Dr. Gundry, uh, and if you take everything he recommends, he'll be taking 400 pills a day. So I don't get how to, how to get, what supplement should I take? For example, according to something I read, UC San Diego says that you gotta take 9,600 units of vitamin D to, it will greatly per, help you prevent cancer. So I keep reading all this stuff, but I don't, if I buy into all of it, I'll be broke. <laughs> I don't know where to go, but I know I should be taking something. <laughs> so risk benefit, your risk of choking might go high enough that your longevity will be impaired. <laughs> or, or as some people say, I'm going to have very expensive I, urine. I knew we were going to have some banter. I knew it. I, yeah, I knew it. So this is great. Um, but the truth is we do need a level of expertise to siphon it down. So when I, to, when I went to medical school, the, the professor said, if you guys spent every waking minute from, from now for the next four years just reading scientific papers, you're gonna be 800 years behind by the time you graduate. <laughs> so our job is to take the relevant, salient, high-level evidence and boil it down and then give you a fire hose to drink from and 10,000 pages to memorize. So I think, I think um, I'll guide you to some resources. Again, I think these, these groups and these organizations are, are gonna put it together. Um, how they put it together is what matters, you know, leveraging the evidence. The one that I tend to steer people to is examine.com. Um, it's a free website. You can look up vitamin D, and they actually link scientific articles, and they give you levels of evidence, um, you know, to help parse it through. They also have, you know, stacks, and I'm sure they charge for certain things too, but um, that seems to be a relatively legitimate source, your physician you know, might be a good, another good source <laughs> if you want to ask them. Um, but I would say, like, vitamin D, 9,600 units a day, that's, you know, vitamin D toxicity is a real thing. And, um, you know, that could be potentially dangerous. And the other thing I'll say, supplements are unregulated. So drugs have very specific uh, kind of 
legislature behind them. To, to have a drug in this country, it's quite a high bar to get there. On average, it takes 10 years and a billion dollars to, to develop a drug. Um, supplements are unregulated, so we don't always know what's in them. So they did a study, they took supplements from Walmart, Kmart, big box stores, um, and they tested them, and they found that a third of the supplements did not have the active ingredient that was tested. A third of them had the ingredient in a different dose that was on the label, and a third of them had the dose accurately as described on the label. So for instance, when we were doing the senescent study, we tested a variety of brands uh, for the Fisetin, and we found one brand, and there's, there are certifications. Like if you go on Amazon.com and look at supplements, you can see if there's certifications. You might want to look into the uh, background of that organization <laughs> to verify that it's legitimate. But the supplement company was to say, you can take any product off of our shelf. We believe in our manufacturing process. You can test it. And if we test at the level we're saying we're giving people, um, we'll give you the stamp and certificate. So that's kind of one way to verify. But I, I, I hate saying do your research. But so you say talk to your doctor. Doctor's you best. <laughs> doctor's best. Doctor. You, you say talk to your doctor, but you are my doctor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See? <laughs> that's, that's that. Just drop the mic. We're talking right now. <laughs> Just, Great punchline. Uh, sir, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I graduated from uh, Long Beach State in 1972. And uh, to Jennifer's point, um, we were doing um, weightlifting then, and it was uh, um, four sets, six reps. Uh, so that, and my, uh, um, my mistake was thinking that I could play football for uh, Long Beach State. So, uh, and that was first year Stanglin from, uh, came over from uh, USC. So that tells you where I went. Um, and then to Bill's comment that uh, um, when you do lift weights, it's a uh, good posture issue. But what do you do when you have scoliosis? It's not a rehab. It's not a. Um, it's not you know uh, an injury. But on the other side is, uh, I have a curvature of the back, and the only thing good about it was it kept me out of the Vietnam War, <laughs> because, <laughs> because uh, when you go down for a physical, they uh, they do a chest X-ray, and but on <clears throat> the stupid side of me thinking that uh, I wanted to join the Marines. And uh, so I figured if I stood this way, it would straighten my back. And anyhow, I got rejected, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, so what do you do when, uh, when <clears throat> you're physically not in rehab, you haven't injured anything, but you have an S curve and your posture sucks. So. <laughs> It's like uh, I, I was taking steroids, uh, Maxibol and Dianabol in college. I had a 19 inch neck, huge arms, just so I could, you know, fake playing football. But uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't conducive to uh, make, basically making the team. But uh, so, and the third comment I have is I, the thought of stretching touching my toes, I want to throw up. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm probably, you throw me in the water and I sink like a rock. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I mean, I love to swim, surf, but uh, I've, I've never been flexible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and with bad posture, it doesn't help either. But there's nothing I can do about the posture. Yeah. Um, First of all, I'm sorry you have to experience something that difficult. Scoliosis is extremely challenging, and all of us in the physical therapy world have dealt with people who have curvatures of the spine in the medial lateral direction with rotational deficits from children growing up to people where it's been so severe they have to put the rod in. It's a challenging thing. It's a structural thing. But you still use the same basic premises, and, and you know, and this is the difficult thing in a Q&A. You, you right. can't answer this in a simple Q&A. Right. It takes time. You said you don't like to stretch and reach your hamstrings, but 
there are ways you can improve mobility in your joints that would unload your spine. Other ways of mobilizing your hips so that when you're bending, you're not putting rotational forces through the spine. There's stabilization things. There's, um, there's specific stretches and movements for people with scoliosis. The best I can do in a Q&A is, it, the, what's helped me with uh, people with scoliosis is the Scroth method. And that's, um, it, was for, it, was a, it was a practitioner out of New York working with professional dancers and he designed these incredible movement patterns that would elongate the short side of the spine. And he could literally see, and he, there's a whole, you can Google it and you'll find all types of it, but he could change the rib cage orientation through breath work. But it takes a skilled practitioner. It's not something, especially, you know, as an elder gentleman, you're gonna just read a book and change this. You're gonna need some coaching and a professional to work with you and use these concepts to feed breath into your spine to create stability and motion that might allow you to move a little bit more freely in space. And you're never gonna, you know, you're always just like someone who has got a severe arthritic joint. You'll never return to full function to the degree you might want, but you can move in baby steps in the right direction. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I agree 100%. You can think about other muscle groups that you can strengthen, like you mentioned your arms, right? Um, you know, focus on the muscle groups that are less affected potentially and maintain the strength as much as possible in those muscle groups as well. But, but I agree, there are things that can be done It's 76 time. years old though? I mean, that's... Yeah, there, you can still adapt, you can still build, you can still, yeah. you know, have, it's gonna take longer and it's going to be more difficult, but it is still possible to, to get some benefits from, right, from well, some of the techniques that Bill described. I don't want to take up anybody. And Dr. Anderson, check your texts. <laughs> I've texted <you> twice. <laughs> uh, Bob Hightower recommended you hire. Oh, awesome. You might have my old cell phone. <laughs> so let's connect after because I, sure. sure. I changed Thank it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you. The Scroth Method. Oh, I'll do the best I can it's, as it sounds. I, um, if you just come close to spelling it, Scroth Method, scoliosis, scoliosis. It's, it's as it sounds, and I, I, I apologize, I can't spell it correctly. S-C-H-R-O-T-H, yeah. That is by far, uh, you know, the most innovative, advanced scoliosis methods I've personally seen, and I constantly get testimony from people who have advanced scoliosis that I use this method, and it's changed my life, particularly dancers with extreme curvatures. The Scroth method. What, Dusty, why don't you spell it for the degree you can? S-C-H-R-O-T-H. Okay, uh, go ahead, ma'am. Um, I just want to thank you all for dedicating your life to this perpetual learning program <laughs> and sharing it with us. Um, I think my question might be best dedicated to Jennifer. Um, first, I was an 08 CU DPT grad, and I can testify she lives what she preaches because she doesn't look like she's aged more than 30 days in the last 15 years. <laughs> it's awesome to see. Um, I am wondering, is there a lot of that science out there as far as aging, um, losing 10% of your muscle mass every decade seems to be a pretty general population uh, research. And do you know of any studies that show at best case scenario with a certain level of activity, a certain level of fitness going into it and activity during those decades? What's like our best case scenario as far as muscle loss? Yeah, what the attenuation of that can be. Yeah. Yeah, there are some studies. There's a group out of Baltimore, and there's a couple, couple groups that have been looking at, you know, how much can you reduce it. You can't eliminate it, but you can absolutely reduce it by at least 60 70% in terms of the, the loss. You're still going to have some muscle atrophy that's, that it eventually over time, you know, is going to happen no matter what type of training you're doing. Um, but I think, I, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with any of the literature in that area with a, a specific percentage as to what you can attenuate. But it's, it's somewhat around in kind of that range. So reason to be optimistic. Yeah. Thank um, you. And with the right training dosage. And it's positive. It's just there's so many variables I mean, from your genetics to where you started. I, I, you know, there's a lot of variables. Yeah, there's, you know, I was involved in a study that looked, and, and these epigenetic studies are, are expanding. You know, someone's capacity to build muscle mass may be inherently driven by 90% of it driven by your genetics. Um, doesn't mean you can't 
you know, you're, 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 doesn't mean you can't alter that trajectory to some degree, but it's a, there's a heavy presence in genetics. We looked at patients that had an ankle fracture, and we did a detailed kind of genetic analysis um, with microarrays and a bunch of other things that help us understand the underpinnings of, what, of who, re, who rehabbed well and built muscle mass and who didn't. And it was really interesting to see how much of it um, kind of came back down to their inherent genetic predisposition. So uh, we have time for one more question, because uh, I know some people need to, to leave. However, um, if there's anyone else has a question, I think maybe we can stay for a few more minutes. You can just approach uh, the panelists on the stage. Um, sir, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> short question. Just one comes across things maybe in Time Magazine, which is not a medical journal, but I remember a long time ago, in, People, scientists were able to increase the lifespan of worms. Now, we're, we're not worms, but then, uh, some of us. <laughs> but, but then the latest one I read was uh, taking young mice, I mean, older mice, and rejuvenating them into younger mice. What the hell's going on there? Yeah, so um, there's some interesting data on that. Nematodes are a type of worm, and that's, um, you know, detailed in David Sinclair's book pretty well. That's where a lot of this started. We've also done research uh, in our group where we've taken an older mouse and a younger mouse, and I know it sounds kind of gruesome, but you can attach their circulatory systems. Um, and just by introducing the blood flow, assuming there's the same blood type, the older mouse will lose the gray hair and, and show signs of reverse aging. Um, and we've seen the same thing with some of our senescence research in animals. You know, animals are genetically similar to us to a, a very high degree, 99.9 .9 plus percent. Now that little percentage accounts for a huge degree of variation in species across the entire planet. Um, so we always have to translate those animal studies to, to human work. Um, but uh, I hope that kind of speaks to what you were getting at. Okay, one more half a question. I have a younger wife who's never met a 14,000 foot peak that she didn't love. Now, at that high altitude, she's got oxygen deprivation. So at what point should she turn around <laughs> and go back down? Uh, better suited for maybe Dr. Kilnani, the pulmonologist. Or <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I wish I could answer that. It's very specific. Uh, Okay, so um, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Super fun. All right, everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you.